So good morning, Alex. Thanks good morning. for joining me here today. You got some questions for me. So why don't you start off just by telling everybody a little bit about yourself and what you're wanting to do on Amazon. Uh, so I have always had an interest in internet marketing. Um, you know, my background uh, is mostly in sales. I've, I've been a salesperson for most of my life, but recently I kind of made a shift from uh, doing some corporate work, um, having a career in that, to just trying to kind of be a, a business owner, be a entrepreneur. Um, and I started out doing a little bit of consulting for a martial arts gym, about especially about their website. And my goal was to have their website actually do work for them, so to generate leads. And then ultimately, um, that was pretty successful, so he kept me on the payroll, he kept me working, started, started to do some advertising, and I got to learn about Facebook ads and some really cool stuff. Um, which led me to uh, another client that was uh, a member of the gym that was interested in having me do some work for their website as well. So um, I kind of took that on. And now this, this website is more of an e-commerce uh, website. And uh, what they sell is uh, skincare products and, and um, cosmetics. So what I wanted to do is I, I noticed that there were some folks on Amazon that were reselling some of our, our products, some of our items, and I uh, wanted to learn more about how to use Amazon effectively and kind of chase some of those resellers out of there, hopefully, and, okay. um, and do that. All right, excellent. So, yeah, basically what they're doing probably is some kind of online or retail arbitrage, because I'm assuming you, you said you're selling your product on your own website. Mm -hmm. And then you're selling it in stores as well, correct? There's a um, there's a, just a couple of retail stores that still have it, so we're almost completely out of that business. And the owner hopes to just sell direct to the to the consumer at some point. Um, but there's just a couple of relationships that are still out there. All right, so you're bringing it all into the e-commerce website then, but. The product's been out there, and the price on Amazon is probably quite a bit higher than what you guys are selling it directly. It is. It is. In fact, uh, an order just came through uh, with like 20 or 30 quantity of a certain uh, product that we carry, and I'm going, yeah, that's probably uh, <laughs> that's probably somebody going to resell that. And that's probably a good indicator that our price is too low on that on that given product. And I do happen to know that they're selling it for all, about forty percent more on Amazon. So definitely, they're doing retail arbitrage. They're just buying from you and then selling it for a higher price on Amazon. I do a lot of that as well. A lot of times, it's clearance stuff from different stores. Uh, I don't do a lot of the online arbitrage, but there's a lot of people who do, which basically just means buying a product at a lower price and selling it for more on Amazon. And if it's a product that people want and it's not on Amazon, uh, you can pretty much get away with selling very things at a very high price that you wouldn't think people would pay the price. But if that's the specific item that they want, they're mm. going to pay a much higher price on Amazon than they otherwise might. Um, so you guys are looking to get on and sell on Amazon uh, so that you can be making that profit instead of the people who are uh, currently selling on there. Yeah, I, I thought that you know being in in a marketplace that just gets just such an enormous amount of traffic and having a product there and having building all of the reviews and having kind of maintaining a good uh, all that good social proof would help us. There'd be some synergy maybe with that to our our current website, you know. But also, just Amazon is is a good place to be. I think it's the future. So. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of people who have their own e-commerce store kind of get afraid of Amazon, like they don't want to list their products on there because they're competing with themselves. But really, Amazon has created a marketplace where there's millions of people who are only going to shop on Amazon. 
they're not going to come to your e-commerce store and buy your products. So if you're not on Amazon, you're really just losing out on those people. And plus, as you can see, there's the opportunity for some products to sell at a higher price on Amazon than you would be able to on your own e-commerce store. Um, so it really helps to, to build your brand and stuff like that to be on Amazon. Um, and since you're the manufacturer and the maker of the products, you can obviously go on and undercut um, price that people are currently selling. There's no way that they compete with you um, so you could easily push them off the product. But that's one thing to keep in mind with Amazon is that it's an open marketplace. Mm -hmm. So even if you were the one who created the listing entirely, Amazon owns that listing. And anyone can come on and sell on that listing. Um, there are certain rules. The product has to be the exact product that's being advertised on the listing. Okay. Um, so that's something that you do have to be a little careful of is that those other people aren't selling knockoff products and just selling it under your name because your name has a good uh, good standing in the marketplace and taking advantage of that you know like Nike has a big problem with people selling knockoff shoes sure. and yeah. it can happen to the smaller businesses as well because it's easier to get away with you don't have lawyers out there looking for knockoffs and stuff like that um, but yeah, I would definitely highly recommend starting to sell on Amazon because there's a lot of profit that you're leaving there. Mm -hmm. And one thing you can do is, uh, down the road with your products, the ones that you send in or sell on Amazon, you can include little cards in them, uh, directing people back to your own website to register, uh, for, deals on different products or whatever it might be. Um, you have Good. to be a little bit careful with that on Amazon because Amazon isn't a big fan of directing people off of their website. I but, imagine they wouldn't be. <laughs> no, but if you open up, uh, let's say, a Sony camera, they're going to have the instruction manual in there with their website and a link to where they can register the products and get discounts and stuff like that. So. The precedent is there and you're no different than uh, Sony or anybody else who's selling on Amazon. So um, it's something to think about down the line. But as far as uh, starting to list on Amazon, it's, it's really very easy. Uh, anybody can go to uh, the website is sellercentral.amazon.com and you can sign up for, you can start with a perfect a personal account but I'd highly recommend signing up for a professional seller account um, it's only 40 bucks a month and it allows you to list a lot more products plus you it just is more like a normal business and Amazon's gonna treat you more like a normal business as far as getting on the Amazon so it's really easy all you got to do is answer a few questions about your your business and your setup and basically ready to start selling on Amazon. Do they care if you're a, a sole proprietor, corporation, or anything, you know, what, like what information do they need from you? Do, they, do you need to have a, a federal tax ID, anything like that? I believe it is required to have a federal tax ID on the professional seller account. If you do the personal account, then it's just gonna go off of your social security number. Um, but a sole proprietorship is fine. You don't have to have uh, like a business registration number or anything like that. You can use a social security number. I would highly recommend that you, if you haven't already set up an LLC, um, you're in Wisconsin, right? I am. And it's, uh, it's really cheap in Wisconsin. I forget exactly how much. I think it's less than $100 to register an LLC. And mm -hmm. it's no different than doing your taxes and such really f as a sole proprietorship, but you get the benefit of the LLC where it gives you a little protection uh, against if you got sued or something like that. Um, obviously, I'm not a lawyer, so you don't want to talk to a lawyer for sure. But basically, the way I understand it is that if I got sued or they sued my business, it would protect 
myself from them being able to come after things that I own personally, like my home and my car and my personal bank account. They could only go after what's in the business. So like my business bank account, inventory and things that the business owns. A lot of people do that. The biggest thing that uh, I've heard over and over from accountants and lawyers and stuff like that is to make sure you have everything separate. Um, okay. So have a separate bank account. Even if you're doing it as a personal bank account, have a separate bank account that all transactions go through and a separate credit card. Even if the credit card's in your personal name because you can't always get a business credit card right off the bat, sure. as long as it's separate, then that shows that if anything was to happen, that the business is separate from you. Uh, so it gives you a little protection there. You know, come tax time, is there any real advantage to the LLC over uh, for, for, in terms of anything, um, you know, reducing your tax liability? No, it's a pass-through entity. So everything comes through to your personal taxes. Um, it's basically just for that liability protection. Okay. Down the line, as you get bigger, you can convert over to like an S corporation. And if you're already an LLC, it's a little easier to convert to an S corporation from what I understand. And then you get tax benefits in where, um, let's say you make a hundred thousand dollars in profit as an LLC or a sole proprietor, you'd have to pay taxes on that hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. But if you were an S corporation, you instead of taking that entire hundred thousand onto your personal taxes, yeah. you'd set a salary for yourself. Uh, it's supposed to be a reasonable salary of what it would cost you to hire someone. So let's say fifty thousand. Um, instead of paying taxes on that hundred thousand, then you'd only pay taxes on the fifty thousand. Not something you want to worry about right now, but down the line, uh, you, that's cool. something that uh, a lot of accountants will recommend to save a lot of money because. You know, on average, 30% taxes on just saving $10,000 in taxes, that's 3000 So now look at 50000 and yeah. you're saving a lot of money really quick. Well, as far as the, the Amazon store, so it's easy to set up the, uh, you know, the, the professional seller account, it sounds like. And then... Um, it's forty dollars a month. What what do you get for your forty dollars? Is it just uh, the ability to to do more listings or automate some things or, or what? I'm not one hundred percent sure all of the benefits, but the big one is the number of products that you can sell. Okay. Um, so with the personal one, I'd have to look up the exact number, but I think you're limited to like forty products or so many sales per month. Um, it might be a dollar amount. I'd have to look on their page. It says there, but um, mm -hmm. it's that's the biggest limitation is that you can only do so many sales per month on the personal before they make you kick it up to the business one. So there's a monthly, right? Um, mm -hmm. And they also charge uh, Amazon charges a, a commission on each sale, and a uh, if you actually use the fulfilled by Amazon, they charge some sort of storage fee if you use that, right? Um, um, that's a really important thing to decide how you're going to do it. So on Amazon, you really have two main ways of selling, either fulfilled by Amazon, the FBA, which is where you are going to take a bulk amount of your products, um, basically whatever you think you can sell on there in a month and send that all into Amazon warehouses. And Amazon will tell you which warehouses to send to. Uh, alternately, you can do FBM, Fulfilled by Merchant, which would be uh, selling single items and then shipping single items to the people who buy them on Amazon. So Amazon would get the sales for you, tell you that they sold, and you would then ship through Amazon. Now, Amazon gets really good rates on shipping, so that's nice. You can buy the shipping labels right through Amazon, so that helps keep shipping costs down. Okay. Um, but the big thing with FBA is uh, that's that little prime check mark that you see on Amazon. Right. And that's very important if you're going to build a, a real successful business on Amazon. Um, now, there's ways to get prime selling as a fulfilled by merchant if you keep your metrics good. So if you're shipping 
I think if you wanted to be a prime seller and ship the items yourself, you have to ship everything within like four hours or something like that and keep all these different metri metrics. So you can do it, but it's really difficult unless uh, you're really on top of that kind of stuff. Um, so for someone who's just starting out, I'd highly recommend doing the Fulfilled by Amazon. And you're going to have those fees, and all those fees are dependent on uh, what the product type is, how big the product is, so basically how much uh, square footage it takes up in Amazon, and then also the selling price. Uh, so they're going to take a percent uh, based on all those variables. Do they charge um, for this? So you said like you want to ship them if you're doing the FBA. You want to ship them about a month's worth of stuff that you think you can sell. Do they charge for that first month or do they begin charging after the first month? It's going to be after the first month. So that's why I say you want to try to manage your inventory so you have 30 days in there like a rolling yeah. 30 days. And if you sure. can keep stuff under that 30 days, then you never really get charged a warehouse storage fee. The warehouse storage fee is just charged after something's been sitting there for a full month. If you, if you kind of put everything together, what percentage of my sales am I going to be giving to Amazon? Like what percentage in fees, you mean? Yeah, in, in, in sales and revenue. Uh, well, most, I'm going to assume since it's beauty products, you probably have a lot of smaller items. Yes. Okay, so your your storage fees are going to be very low um, because they're smaller items. Uh, so you're basically going to have uh, like the FBA fee and then the uh, referral fee. So basically Amazon providing the traffic for your sale. Um, and I'd have to look for sure, but it could be anywhere from 20% to 40%, depending on the price of the product. And a lot of people only do the FBM because they are they think they're getting ripped off by the FBA, but you have to think about what you're getting for that. So you're with the FBA, you're getting all of the marketing of Amazon. Um, you're getting to store your stuff in their warehouses. You're getting the employees to ship your product when they sell. Um, you're getting Amazon pays for all the shipping to the customer and the customer gets free shipping. We all know nothing is free, but right. they get free shipping included in that uh, FBA fee that you're getting. Um, if mm -hmm. the customer has any problems, they call Amazon support and Amazon handles all of the support. If they want to return something, Amazon handles the return and pays for all the return shipping as well. So you get a lot included in that FBA fee, even though it sounds like a high percent. Um, just think about that price, those prices that you would have to pay for someone else to do that or shipping and all that stuff. Um, it, it actually ends up being a pretty good deal for most products. If you're talking sure. about really big and heavy stuff, then it yeah. can be a little more questionable. But, but for something small, I think it would be more than worth the, the money that FBA charges. Does the seller get some feedback that if we are seeing some sort of a recurring pattern with something getting returned or something getting marked down for uh, or dissatisfaction from the customer, uh, am I going to see, if I'm using the FBA, am I going to see that feedback? Am I going to know to change anything? Yeah, so it's uh, a little bit buried, but there are re is a report in the, your business reports that will tell you uh, the reasons that the customer stated for the return. Okay. Um, so you can get an idea of what the problem might be. It can be a little bit skewed, and I'm not really familiar with the makeup thing, but you could get a little bit of skewing there because Amazon has those free returns as long as there's something wrong with the product. Um, if they go on there and say they want to do a return because they don't like it or they bought the wrong one, then Amazon will try to charge a small uh, return shipping fee for that. So you will have customers say that there's something wrong with the product just to get that free return shipping from Amazon. Um, so you have to kind of weigh that in there. 
But sure. like you said, if you see a recurring pattern that uh, you know the makeup doesn't stay on my face or, or whatever, or the color's wrong, and you see that over and over on the same product, then uh, that would be something that you could take into consideration to figure out what might be going on there. I see listings on Amazon that are that are really good and ones that are not so good. So I, I feel like I have a little bit of a, and just having written uh, a whole bunch of different sales pages and things like that and sales emails, I think I have a little bit of a, an edge maybe on some of my competition there. But I do notice that a lot of things that I see on Amazon are the same price or cheaper than you would find on someone's website, on the, that direct seller's website, which confounds me to no end. Like you would think that they would mark it up because Amazon is taking um, a little bit of a, a commission on that. But then I, it does kind of make sense because there's probably a whole bunch of other people competing with you and that's just driving down the price probably, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, you got to remember on Amazon, you're competing with everyone else who sells a similar product as yours. Um, mm -hmm. So you're not only competing with potentially other people who might be selling on your listing, let's say if you had wholesale sailors and stuff like that, you'd also be... Uh, competing with anybody who has similar products. So you kind of have to weigh that and find the perfect price on Amazon where you're maximizing your profit and maximizing your sales. You know, um, you don't want to be too cheap and get a ton of sales but not make enough profit or be too expensive and then not get any sales. So you got to find that happy medium. So it really depends. And some, some, uh, you got to position yourself where you want to be as well. Do you want to be in the top of the market, the middle of the market, or the bottom of the market? And I would say you probably want to go towards the top of the market, be one of the more expensive players, and sell your product based on value or perceived value from the customer in that you're a better product. Because you could take two exact same products and sell them on Amazon under different names and one's $5 higher than the other. And yeah. the $5 one might get more sales or at least more profit because of the perceived higher value of that product. So you gotta keep that in mind that uh, people kind of think that way. If it's cheap, then they think they're getting a cheap product. If it's expensive, then they think they're getting a good product. And we're actually in the natural niche so to speak so I think you're definitely right we'd be wanting to be in the higher end segment but um, I've heard a lot of internet marketers talk about this a little bit well at least some of the courses and stuff that are floating out there about how to resell and do some of this arbitrage stuff uh, they're talking about uh, on Amazon above a certain price the pricing is less of a factor in the minds of the customer, um, and I've heard that that uh, threshold be like about thirty dollars or something. In your experience, what is that number? Personally, I'm not exactly sure, but you know, it really depends on what category you're in as well. Because let's yeah. say you're selling TVs, mm -hmm. you know, for the most part nowadays. TVs are mostly very similar from the cheap one to the more expensive one. Obviously, there's differences. Now you have curved TVs and 4K and 8K and 50,000K will be coming soon, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> but a lot of times people are just, you know, they're looking for the cheapest TV. You know, I want the cheapest 55-inch TV that has good reviews. And that's the one they're going to grab. But like, as you said, in the, in the natural... Uh, health and beauty area it's going to be different because the people who are looking for that product are used to paying more and are willing to pay more for something that uh, they know or believe is good or better than uh, what other people are selling out there uh, what that number is I don't know if there's an exact number it's really going to depend by the category of course I mean you're not going to have a $30 TV so it really mm -hmm. depends. But once you get over a certain amount, yeah, it's going to be uh, less 
a factor until you reach the point where it is a factor again because if you let's say you're selling a $30 set of makeup everybody's selling it at 30 and yours is at 100 well that's probably going to be too big of a variance to justify someone doing that or buying yours but if everybody else is selling it at 30 and you're selling it at 40 well that ten dollars uh, the perceived value might be enough that they're going to go ahead and purchase the the higher value one but I'm, I'm really glad you brought up the reviews because i know it's such an important uh, when you're selling on amazon the reviews are super important when i do a search on amazon i'm almost everything i look for i'm filtering by uh prime and four stars or higher mm -hmm. <laughs> that's like so that's just how I do, uh, and I actually have my Amazon quite a bit. Um, but I'm, I'm guessing I'm not alone, and I'm guessing that it can be a challenge to build up reviews when, when you just put your pro when your your product's brand new on Amazon or your listing is new. Um, can you speak to some of the ways to get those reviews, uh, get those built up quickly, and anything else I might want to do? for the first few listings? Yeah, sure. So reviews are definitely important. Um, no doubt about that. Uh, how important they are depends on the category that you're in. And it also depends on the quantity that your competition has. Um, so let's say in your market, if you do a search for your main keyword that you think someone would search for, and your product has five reviews and everybody else has 500, then it's gonna be a factor. Um, but let's say you have 100 reviews and everybody else has 200 reviews, it's probably not gonna be a big difference in uh, getting the sale from 100 to 200. Um, five to 100 or 200 or more, then that could play a role in uh, people's decisions. Um, and especially the star rating you know how high that rating is if i'm looking at the products and everybody's got 500 reviews but this guy's got 4.9 and everybody else has four or three then I'm, the kind of the no-brainer is that i'm going to go with the 4.9 stars mm -hmm. um, and i do the same thing in sorting by uh, reviews and all that stuff but we have to keep in mind too that you and i as entrepreneurs are not normal people uh, so we, we're not the people who you want to look at as to how the normal Amazon person is searching. The normal Amazon person is probably searching and they're going to search for the keyword um, natural makeup or whatever it might be. And they're going to look at that first page. Maybe they'll click that prime button because they want the free shipping. That's probably the most common thing. Uh, but from there, they're probably just looking at that first page and buying from there, which is why it's so crucial that you get up to that first page uh, when someone searches for your main search terms that uh, you expect people to be searching for. Um, and there's different tools uh, that you can use out there to uh, determine what those search terms are for your competition. Um, like the one that I use. So this is like a, an ex a Chrome extension or it's a standalone? It's a uh, Chrome extension and ooh. it's called Scope. Um, S-C-O-P-E, just like it sounds. And it's made by the people over at uh, Seller Labs. Uh, so it does cost money to get the service. Um, but mm -hmm. what that does is you can go to any listing and just open that up and it shows you all of the keywords uh, or search phrases that they are ranking for and an estimated number of sales that they think they're selling for. Now it's not gonna be perfect, but it's gonna give you an idea of what those products are ranking for and how much they're selling for. And so that sounds like a really powerful tool. Um, are you, I know you, you, you probably have your own proprietary secret sauce method of doing things, but you know, what are some, some tips to make sure you get on the, the front page of that search? So it's not really not really a secret. Um, you do you know of Scott Volker over at the Amazing Seller? Uh, I heard the name come up in one of your videos that you posted on Facebook, and then I looked it up, and um, 
I think I just read a little bit on on the sales page, but I, I have I don't have the course or anything like that. Okay, so I would I would highly recommend checking out some of his stuff. Everything or most of what I've learned and that got me started has come from his podcast and from his. Uh, uh, he's got a private label workshop, which is free. Uh, that would be something I would highly recommend you run through. I think it's about an hour long and kind of goes through all the steps because you're basically selling a private label product. So private label is basically just means it's your product with your brand on it. But in terms of getting that your product ranked, what you'll want to do, uh, another great Chrome extension is Jungle Scout. Um, you can install that in Chrome and then you go to you do a search for the search term that you believe is the most likely term uh, that people are going to search to find your product and then you click the Jungle Scout app and it will show you the estimated number of sales for all of those products on that first page and then you can figure out how many products they're selling in a month you divide that by 30, and that's the number of products they're, they're selling per day. And you wanna to try to sell that amount for at least eight days in a row, uh, eight days or more. So you can do that either by uh, giving a discount out. So I don't know, do you have maybe an email list built up? I do, yeah. Um, okay. It's not a big one, but, but well, yes. It's, it's a place to start that's a big big thing to do for building your brand is getting a big email list because what you can do is say hey we're launching our product on Amazon and because you guys are our loyal customers we're gonna give you 30% off or 50% off or whatever amount you think it will take for them to get uh, excited about it since they're already your customers they're probably it'll take less for to get them excited so maybe 30 or 40 percent you can play with that to see what starts getting you some sales um, you can start off by launching to your list like that and then you could also use uh, services like uh, jumpsend.com to try and give away your product to an, a market or a group of people that are basically there to try to get cheap products um, it's not quite as good because you're gonna have to get of give a lot bigger discount mm -hmm. um, maybe 70 or 80 or 90 percent to really get people interested but the goal is here to get people to buy enough of your product every day for eight days to match those number estimated number of sales um, and the reason for eight days is because Amazon kind of has a rolling count of the number of products that you sell. I, nobody knows for sure, but it's like the first hour, um, last 24 hours, the last uh, week, last month, the last three months, year, and, and whatever it may be. And that's how they determine what ranking people are gonna get on their website. Because obviously for Amazon, they make money by selling products. So they want the products that are the best sellers and the best for the customer to show up first. And the best way for them to determine that is the number of people are buying it. If more people are buying your product, then that yeah. must be a good product. So they're gonna move it up in the rank. And so I get I get that, that um, you know, you're, you're gonna give more traffic as a result of ranking. Yep. But do you, I mean, are you going to have to maintain, let's say, you know, you do an email blast and, and you do get a bunch of people in that first eight days. Um, do you have to maintain that level of sales and can ranking high kind of do that for you? Or are you still going to have to, uh, you know, keep hustling month every month to, to give discounts and or try to boost that number somehow? It really depends on the depth of your market and how how much competition, I should say, is in the market on Amazon. So mm -hmm. if you search for your main keyword and everybody's got a thousand or more reviews and you use Jungle Scout and everybody's selling like 3,000 products a month mm -hmm. of their items, then yeah, you're oh, yeah. probably going to be in it where you're going to have to be giving product away 
uh, every month, every week to maintain that spot because those other people are going to be doing the same. It just becomes a competition. So you have to determine what your profit is and how much it's going to cost to give you away those products and calculate that into your final, your bottom line uh, for what profit levels you're willing to take off of the product. And that's going to just have to be included in as part of your marketing. You got to you got to kind of think of it as advertising, you know, your e-commerce yeah. store, you advertise it to get traffic to there. You either advertise it on Google or you do search engine optimization or you advertise it on Facebook and you're paying to do that. Same kind of thing on Amazon. Amazon's doing all the marketing to get people to their platform. And now you do the advertising to make sure that your product shows up first uh, with those people. Um, now, in addition oh. to that, though, Amazon does have advertising inside of it. So you can run ads for your product because everything you search on Amazon, like the first few are going to be sponsored ads. You'll see the little sponsored ad link underneath there. And then even scattered down below and in the middle, there's going to be sponsored ads as well. And that's people paying. Uh, so for so much per click so you could say I'm willing to pay two dollars per click and You're gonna bid against other people and be ranked on the page uh, depending on those bids Now you only pay if people click though. So um, That's a whole nother game that you'd have to dig into and that you're gonna want to turn on and do for your launch uh, because it's gonna help you start getting more sales through those sponsored ads but the goal with the sponsored ads is at the beginning, you're going to lose a lot of money. Um, but for example, I use a tool called, uh, um, what's it called? Called Ignite uh, by the same people over there at Seller Labs. And what that does is it tracks all of my advertisements, what people are clicking on and what terms they're searching for. And it slowly narrows in the terms so that it becomes cheaper to advertise so that you can get it down to let's say your profit on an item is 50 percent um, if you get your advertising down below 50 percent average cost of sale is what amazon calls it acos mm -hmm. if you get your acos your average cost per sale down below 50 percent well now you're getting those sales either at break even or below the goal obviously is to get it below, but you kind of got to think of those sponsored ads as just additional advertising and traffic to boost your listing to get organic sales and uh, help more organic sales roll in as well. You know, sometimes when I click on things on Amazon, I see some of that stuff on Facebook. Is there the ability to retarget to other platforms at all with, with ads? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So Amazon does a lot of that for you. Um, mm -hmm. If you you search for your product on Amazon, or not Amazon, but on Google, uh, you very well might see Amazon ads for your product right on there um, because Amazon does a lot of that for you. Now, on the other hand, you can run your own Google and I would more recommend probably Facebook and Instagram, but you'd have to figure out where your market is hanging out. Um, and drive traffic that way. Now you wouldn't want to drive the traffic directly to Amazon because you can't track it from there. You don't know mm -hmm. if they bought or anything else or what happened to them after that. What instead mm -hmm. what you would want to do, you have your own e-commerce site. So from Facebook, you'd want to drive them to your e-commerce site, maybe to a landing page where you're doing a giveaway for like a $200 basket of your uh, cosmetics or whatever you want to give away. And people can register to win that product. So you're going to build your email list that way. And you're going to have maybe a series of emails that after people sign up, you try to get them to share the giveaway for more entries. And there's different tools out there to help with that as well. Who owns the email addresses that, uh, let's say somebody purchases from Amazon from, from you, do you get to keep that customer information? Can I import that into my email list and all of that? 
No, unfortunately not. The email addresses are all anonymized because Amazon ah. doesn't want you to steal those customers. But that's why I say doing a Facebook ad for your products to a contest, now you get their email address. And then after the contest is over, you give a winner um, and you send an email and say, hey, we've picked a winner. Click here to see if it was you. And it takes them to another page and it shows the name of the winner and then offers them maybe 30% uh, or 50% off the product that you just gave away. Uh, to help boost sales on Amazon as well, but then also you have their email address forever unless they unsubscribe, so you can keep providing value to them and marketing to them. Now, you just don't want to market to your email list. You want to start providing value. Like, I don't know, on your current e-commerce website, if you have a blog and you do tips and tricks and things like that for using your products? It's very new. I just launched it in January, and... <clears throat> All I've done is uh, one shameless uh, website launch, uh, <laughs> email, uh, you know, and, and kind of revenue grab from, from that discount, that coupon. So, but, okay. you know, it was successful. We got a whole bunch of orders in, but, and we just got this started. And, yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you. We're going to be doing some uh, value giving emails and all of that in the series, hopefully warming up that relationship even more. Yeah, it's really important. So uh, I don't know if you know who Gary Vaynerchuk is. I do, yeah. Yeah, he has a book yeah. called Jab, 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 Right Hook. Yeah. And that's exactly what you want to do with your emails. So you have you provide value, you provide value, provide value, and then you go with the with a sales pitch. Ask for um, visit. Yeah. But you always want to provide more value than sales because people aren't going to stay signed up to your email list if you're just trying to sell to them all the time. But if you're you're saying, hey, check out this uh, new way to get rid of acne or whatever the case may be, um, and you're breaking it down or writing a nice long blog post or uh, making a YouTube video, whatever is uh, easiest for you, uh, on how people can help themselves and live a better life or use their cosmetics better or beauty products or whatever it is um, that's going to help people stay on your email list and also build up kind of a loyal following because people will be like, well, this guy helped me with all this free information. Now when I need the products, well, I'll, I'll buy through him. He's giving me all this free stuff. So um, yeah, I've seen, I've seen that work with with many many different bloggers and different uh, websites that I've I've followed. That person, these thought leaders, are kind of in a completely different place now because of that approach. So I'm a big believer in that. Yep. Yeah, it's kind of the only way to do it nowadays. I mean, people are so used to being sold to that they can smell it a mile away. Um, and they're they're tired of it, and especially the younger generations as well. I mean, they don't even pay attention to half of that stuff. They're getting blasted so much that you just tune it out. So, but if you're there providing value and giving them a reason to follow you, that when you do go ahead and make a sale or try to make a sale, no one's going to care, and some people will even buy from you just to thank you for providing the content that you provided. We're really digging deep here, but I, I just had a quick, uh, just to come back to the ranking factors for a second. How, how much of a ranking factor is like the sales volume compared to other things? I, I imagine it's not the only ranking factor, right? Like there's got to be just the quality of, of uh, it's just how many images you have in your listing, I'm guessing, because people want to. I'm speculating here, so correct me if I'm totally off on, on this stuff. Um, there, there's probably a couple other ranking factors that are, you know, if your volume is lagging a little bit, you can at least make up for a little bit in other areas. The ranking, and again, nobody knows exactly how Amazon does it, but the ranking is pretty much all the quantity of sales. Um, okay. If not all of it, I would say probably 95, 96 percent or higher okay. um, everything else is conversion factors uh, which plays just as important of a role because let's say Amazon 
you get a bunch of sales from your launch that we did and so Amazon moves you up to the top and now you're getting a thousand people to visit your listing but only 10 of those are buying your product Mm -hmm. uh, Amazon's not going to keep giving you all those clicks if you're not getting the conversions and mm -hmm. the conversions have to do with uh, number one your pictures uh, having awesome pictures uh, that are highly uh, and professionally done um, so I would highly recommend getting like a professional photographer do it to do them for you if you can find somebody local it's awesome because then you can keep going to them mm -hmm. and in the long run the price is usually cheaper um, but then also your title, having a good catching title that is easy for the customer to read, but also has your keywords in it, your key phrases. Um, and then the bullet points from there, having bullet points that um, don't only say like the benefits of the product, but emotionally connect with the customer. So your makeup might be natural. So you could say, well, we have all natural uh, beauty products and that's fine. But you want to say why that's important and tell the customer that if you want clearer skin, then get our acne cream because it's all natural and safe for your skin and it's not gonna whatever cause wrinkles or whatever the case may be I don't know enough about it but um, I know exactly I know exactly what you mean absolutely I try to you know put that into my my copywriting uh, making sure that every feature that I list connects emotionally to, to a problem that the, the customer yep. has I think that's a really good point um, as far as the, the, the title, though, you brought up the title, uh, I see sometimes when I search for products, like on my website, my e-commerce website right now, you know, I optimize for certain keywords that are, in my mind, the person's looking for a product. And I often get some of these sponsored Google um, product image kind of things pop up and I often see Amazon listings pop up which tells me the Amazon is getting indexed quite a bit if Google thinks you're <clears throat> searching for a product um, Amazon gets uh, gets you know uh, gets indexed in that search result so how, how important is thinking about Google SEO when creating your Amazon listing title or whatever it's it's definitely important um, that's kind of where your search terms search phrases come in um, so that tool that I mentioned earlier scope that's mm -hmm. a really good one for finding out going to your competition your big biggest competition and using that tool to find out what they're actually selling for um, now you're gonna have to use your common sense and kind of weed out the terms that don't make sense because what scope does is it just finds all of the terms or search phrases that they rank for and then gives you an idea of what they might be selling through there but if they're selling acne cream and they're ranking for uh, uh, nail polish obviously you know there's a disconnect there so even though they're, they're showing up for it they're probably not getting many sales through that so you kinda you gotta use your own common sense for that and determine what phrases are most important and uh, put those into your title and you pretty much want to use up all the space that Amazon gives you in your title but you have to remember that while you're trying to rank on Amazon and Amazon is looking for those search terms it's the buyer who has to read that title and the title has to make sense so you have to kind of weigh it back and forth and make sure you're getting all the search terms in there but the title makes sense and that it's not just a bunch of words put together. Right. Okay. That's good advice. Um, so it's just kind of finding the happy medium between those things. I find that that's true in SEO in general for just for regular, like you need, you need to know what people are searching for and sometimes what they're searching for is a little weird. So you got to think about how to stitch that into a good usability experience mm -hmm. when they actually do hit your website or they hit the page that that they, they click on so that they're still 
you know, looking for, or they're, just, they're feeling like they're matching what they're looking for. So, and that's where uh, you really have to keep in mind that the CEO for Amazon, search engine engine optimization for Amazon, is completely different than for Google. Right. Um, it's not going to be the same phrases, and that's one reason you're going to want to blog on your e-commerce store because on Am or on Google, they might search for how to get rid of acne. And if you wrote a blog post on how to get rid of acne using your all natural products, then that might show up and they click on it and that's what they're looking for. They're not necessarily looking to buy yet mm -hmm. uh, on Google, but on Amazon, you go to Amazon to buy products. You don't go to Amazon necessarily to research how to do something. So on Amazon, the keyword or the search phrase might be best acne cream or acne cream or whatever they're searching for. So the <clears throat> phrase is going to be different than what you're going to be targeting on Google. You know, some people search and buy on Google. Not everybody's on Amazon, obviously, but for the majority, the search phrases are going to be different between Google and Amazon. That's good. That's, um, yeah, I see. I mean, just that volume thing that you were talking about, how important that is, that is completely different way of thinking about it than thinking about how to rank on Google um, and how to make sure your listing stays high. Yep. Um, yeah, the uh, Google's looking for the most relevant content and Amazon is looking for the best product to sell you. So, completely yeah. different ways of looking at the content. Great stuff. Um, I guess just uh, at this point, I think I need to get my, my store opened and start putting some listings out there um, and just start, you know, think about doing a launch like you said to try to get that first wave of sales in there quickly. Yep. Um, I see I see that sometimes I get a box from Amazon and it and uh, it's got something or it's, there's an email follow-up often where it's like, uh, tell us what you think of the product. Uh, how is it? Uh, you know, how is it going with it? It, it? Soliciting reviews, basically. Do you recommend mm -hmm. that sort of approach too? Uh, yeah, one hundred percent. That's absolute must. Um, and you can either do that manually through Amazon's back end, sending emails, or you can automate that with a program, uh, another service that you'd have to pay for, but well worth it. Uh, I believe the one I use is called Salesbacker. Okay. And that automates sending those emails and you can set it up to send uh, like immediately after the purchase, uh, immediately after it ships, one day after they receive it, and then maybe a couple weeks after they receive it, I believe is the uh, sequence that I use uh, to keep mm -hmm. people informed that, hey, your product shipped, hey, you should have gotten your product yesterday, let us know if there's any issues, and then maybe a week to 14 days after, you send and say, hey, uh, hope everything's going good. If not, let us know. And can you click here to leave us uh, feedback? And that would go to your, to leave seller feedback, not product reviews yet. You want to leave seller feedback on your account because you want to build your seller feedback because that's kind of your reputation on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And then for the people who leave you positive feedback, then you can go back into Amazon and send them an email asking if they would review the product. So, so you can, um, you can still send your customer stuff out of Amazon as, as a mass email. Is that what you're saying? So, so you can, um, you can still send your customer stuff out of Amazon as, as a mass email. Is that what you're saying? Um, not as a mass email, really, but Salesbacker basically connects into Amazon and just sends the email for you through their system. So you can um, have it, templates it, of emails and just automate those emails going out and they'll customize them for you depending on the product that they bought and things like that. But if I'm logged into my Amazon seller account, how do I? How can I communicate with my? Uh, let's say a recent customer. I can only basically send them like a message through the system individually, but not. I can't do like a batch or a group kind of thing, right? 
Correct. I don't believe that there's any way to batch. Um, yeah. You get like a scrambled email address, so I guess you could collect those and send a batch, but I'm not sure if that would be against Amazon's terms of service or not to do that because they really only want you to communicate with the customer about their particular order. So if you started sending them, you know, saying, hey, we got this promotion or whatever, then Amazon wouldn't like that very much. And you also don't want to ask for positive reviews yeah. or five-star reviews or anything because that's against the terms of service as well. That brings me to a good segue here. What, what should I do to avoid getting, getting my uh, account suspended or whatever? Um, you know, what are what are like big no nos that you need to steer clear of with being an Amazon seller? So, like I said, I think the biggest one right now, especially since Amazon got kind of attacked in the media over it, was the review thing. Um, back say a year ago. Uh, what people would do to launch is that we would give product away for free in exchange for reviews. Okay. Um, now, we wouldn't say that they had to leave a five-star review, but these groups were basically conditioned to leave positive reviews in exchange for free product. Um, mm -hmm. And Amazon came down on that and said, can't do that anymore. If you do that, we find out we're going to remove the review, and if you keep doing it, we're going to suspend your account. Even if they say they got it for free in the review, it's not allowed anymore? Correct. Nope, they don't want any of that. That'll get removed. Solicited reviews can get you banned, right? Yeah, so you want to be careful with that. Um, okay. In addition to that, getting kicked off of Amazon, you kind of just got to think to yourself and just try, kind of feel, does this feel right? Um, if what you're doing kind of feels a little shady or maybe in the gray area, then you probably want to be a little careful about doing that. Let's take a gray area example and tell mm -hmm. me if, you, if this would fly or not, or tell me if you would do this. So you have legitimate product reviews on your website from mm -hmm. customers. Can you take that and put that on your Amazon? Um, you can't put it on your Amazon, but what you could do, and other people have done, and it's not against terms of service or anything like that, as long as you don't ask them to leave you a five-star review, but you yeah. could send an email out to your past customers and say, hey, we launched on Amazon. Can you go over and let us know what you thought of this product and leave a review over on Amazon? Um, now, if they're still on your email list, they probably liked the product, so hopefully they'll leave a five star. But as long as you don't ask them to leave a five star or a positive review, uh, then you'd be fine doing that. Now, and that would be actually a really good tactic as part of that uh, opening uh, launch strategy to start getting some reviews. Um, but unless those people bought on Amazon, they're not going to be verified reviews. So there's uh, on if you look at a product, there's going to show verified purchaser next to some people's names or most people. If they didn't purchase the product and they left a review, then it doesn't say that. So those reviews don't have as much weight with Amazon in terms of the how good your product is, um, but it can help you convert uh, with other people that maybe don't know your brand or just finding your product. So it's definitely a good idea. Uh, but sure. I would do that with the thought in mind that they could get removed. Um, Amazon does go through and clean up reviews from time to time, so if for whatever reason they think that those reviews are not uh, valid or they're just not good being on there, they might just remove them. Uh, so they'll, they'll probably stick for a week, a month, a year, maybe forever, but eventually they might just get clear it out of there as the automated system goes through and cleans things up. And I just have a couple last questions. I promise it's, it's, been, it's been a really good conversation. It's been really helpful. Yeah, I absolutely. Think, I think I'm enjoying it. Whole page of notes here too. Um, so, okay, so I have these two clients right now I'm, I'm, I'm working with. If, if I wanted to get something on my own going because I want to build another stream, I want, eventually I want to, I want to be able to to have some e-commerce, passive income, maybe some other source to where I don't need to 
you know, track down and work with, with, with clients as much. Um, mm -hmm. And I could just have my own kind of my own business. Um, there are a bunch of different business models that I've seen with selling on Amazon. Um, you know, maybe it might be helpful if you tell me, like, if you can tell me, like, ones that just for sure don't work. Uh, sure. Or uh, I could just give you a couple examples, like, you know, I've seen ones where people buy on eBay, sell on Amazon, or vice versa. I've seen, uh, you know, I, I hear about a lot about AliExpress. Um, there's mm -hmm. a guy out there named Alex something that's pushing this whole, um, you know, buy on, uh, on AliExpress and resell on uh, Amazon or whatever. Um, you know, the, the drop shipping model versus carrying the inventory. Uh, I guess, can you give me some pros and cons of like I, I, drop shipping, you know, it's pretty obvious you don't carry the inventory, you're just kind of making a little bit of that difference. Of, but is it, you know, can you, you would have to sell a pretty high volume, I think, to make the kind of money that you would be able to replace an income with that. Mm -hmm. And at that level, you'd have to automate for sure the ordering process, I feel like, across those platforms if someone places an order through your website and then you're reordering it through AliExpress or you know somebody places the order on Amazon whatever it may be um, what are your thoughts on like what what's sustainable as a you know to replace let's say an income of fifty thousand dollars or more uh, what would you go with so yeah, there's obviously a lot of options and I've done a lot of them from retail arbitrage to wholesale to private label. I've done the eBay flipping as well and I haven't done drop shipping, um, but there's a lot of different options out there. Um, the one that I am pushing towards the most is wholesale and private label through Amazon FBA fulfilled by Amazon and the reason is for that is it's the most reliable and Amazon really likes the fulfilled by Amazon part of it um, unless you're fulfilled by merchant and you can get to the point where you're doing that prime shipping you know you're on top of everything and you're you're moving product is and getting it out the door and you can do that seller fulfilled prime it's called um, that would be another option but with that then you have to have a warehouse and keep all the products and ship everything individually as well so it's a whole nother business model as opposed to what I'm looking at um, the retail arbitrage I still do a fair amount of that and make uh, a lot of good money off of that so that market is still very good but with like the online arbitrage and the eBay flipping and such like that, I think that is going to be getting more and more difficult. I don't really do any of that anymore. Mm -hmm. And you see a lot of tools now that automate just about all of that from going out to websites and scraping websites and finding profitable products on Amazon and stuff like that and I kind of feel like once you get to that level that a lot of the profit is going to be out of that market unless you are so fast at getting those products purchased and onto Amazon and sold um, that you're going to lose or have the potential to lose any profit or maybe even the original money that you spent on the product. So it's going to get more and more difficult as it gets easier and easier. You know, it seems whenever something starts getting more and more easy to do, it's going to get more and more difficult to make profit. Which thing is getting easier? You think wholesale arbitrage or or, or retail arbitrage? Online arbitrage and eBay flipping. And I say easier uh, in that it's automated and you don't have to do as much work because that okay. means that people are going to see the quick buck and more people are going to jump in there and do it. Um, easier for people to get into the game and start doing it, which is going to drive down prices and 
the key for online arbitrage and eBay flipping is that you get it into Amazon, you sell it quickly before other people do the same thing and drive the price down. At the, where your alternative to this is is ordering a, a giant pallet of something from a wholesaler and uh, getting that on to uh, Amazon's warehouse mm -hmm. and, and, and selling it that way. Is that, do I have it about right? Correct. Um, but the big thing with like wholesale, for example, yeah. is that I can order all the product that I think I'm going to need for the next month and get it into Amazon and kind of keep rolling that and ordering product and sending it in and I can repeat that with the same product as long as that product is selling profitable. Uh, with online arbitrage and eBay, a lot of times you can't do that. A lot of times it's a one-off. You can only buy so many products and then they're gone if it's a clearance um, or the price changes on eBay or the sales ends on the e-commerce site that you're buying the, the arbitrage products from. Uh, but with wholesale, I know how much I'm going to spend. I know how it's gonna, much it's going to be. I know what my profit is going to be. And I know how long it's going to take for me to get it and get it into Amazon. And so I can keep reordering to keep my stock in there and uh, keep selling that same product where with online arbitrage and eBay, it's a never ending battle. Even with retail arbitrage, it's a never ending battle of finding new products because the products right. you bought last month or last week are no longer profitable. Uh, so you can't buy those same ones anymore. So what advice would you have to find, uh, because I, you know, I do have an idea for, like, there is sort of a, a, a niche that I know pretty well. Uh, I'm a, a home brewer. I, I make beer. I've been doing that for many, many years. And there's some higher end products that experienced home brewers will, you know, will spend a lot of money on. And um, so I, you know, I've always had a little bit of this idea of maybe doing an Amazon store for something like that how would you approach like your or find a wholesaler uh, for uh, you know a product let's say you don't know anybody in the, in the industry at all how, how did you kind of set up your first few wholesale relationships so I basically just started cold emailing people um, okay. what I did is I have a niche that I like to do my wholesale in because I'm very familiar with it and I know what works, what doesn't. Um, and one of the key things that I've done to be profitable is create packages out of products. So put two products or more that I know go good together and sell those as a package. And that way I'm the only seller selling that and I can make more profit off of that. With finding those products, what I did is I went to a niche website for the niche that I'm in. So for years for the beer brewing, there's probably a e-commerce website out there that is the largest e-commerce seller of those products in that niche. So you find that and then go in there, click through the products and for every product it's going to have a brand name. So take that brand name, search for it in Google, find their website, find their contact us link and send them off an email and say, hey, I'm an, uh, an Amazon specialist, Amazon resale specialist. I would like to get a wholesale price list and possibly sell your products at wholesale. Please uh, send me an email or give me a call and I'd send that off to as many brand or manufacturers that I could find on that website you know, 20, 30, 40, 60, 100, and you're going to get replies from a good number of them. Um, a lot of them will say, we're not looking for anybody to sell on Amazon or to sell, you have to have a retail store, but a good number of them will say, yeah, here you go, here's the list, or they'll say, fill out this form and then we'll send you the list. And um, that's how I found some of my big wholesalers. So I've got I've got one really big one and then several uh, medium size and a couple small ones uh, that I'm doing and selling their products now and those are going very well. So that's, that's kind of how I did it. You just cold emailing basically. Mm -hmm. I guess you could call as well, but yeah. I think into today's world, you know, a lot of people are really busy 
and an email is just easier to send off and then they can reply at their convenience. Are a lot of them requiring you to submit some sort of um, you know your your history as a seller your I don't know what uh, I just remember when I had a business a long time ago in a completely different industry some some of these places to set up an account you had to either go through a credit check or you had to uh, have some kind of references or something like that. Uh, do you find that's uh, at all the uh, a hurdle in this? Um, yeah, definitely for the bigger ones. Uh, the smaller wholesalers, they didn't yeah. really ask me for anything. They just sent me, here's the price list, let us know what you want to buy kind of thing. Yeah. And the bigger ones, though, they will ask for trade references. Um, and I'm assuming you buy your ingredients from somebody so they would be your trade reference especially if they provide you any kind of net terms you know they provide you product on uh, on an invoice that you're going to pay later yeah. uh, that's big and helpful um, another one that they'll ask for is like your bank they'll ask for uh, your banker so if you mm -hmm. develop a relationship with a banker at the bank that you have uh, the, your business accounts at um, mm -hmm. that's helpful so you can provide his information and they can get uh, information from them to make sure that you're a real business basically they just want to make sure that um, you're a real business you're not just a fly-by-night kind of person mm -hmm. and if they're going to give you net terms they want to make sure that you're going to actually pay them now some of the wholesalers that I buy from I am still buying with credit card up front, which I'm going to be emailing them and talking with them to change that to net terms because that's just kind of nice to be able to buy and sell the products before you actually get them or before mm -hmm. you actually have to pay them, I should say. Yeah. Um, so that's nice. But just try to come up with, they usually like three trade references and then a bank reference. Um, if you don't have those, then you're going to have to target the smaller manufacturers who are going to give you those terms without any kind of trade references so you can build those trade references up and then just let them know that say hey I'm applying to sell this person's products can I use you as a trade reference um, and most people don't have any problem with that uh, just out of curiosity are you familiar with the American Express plum card American Express plum card yeah no I'm not it's the, the whole, <laughs> I only bring this up because you said trade terms and I used to um, do some, some sales training for American Express and they're, they're, I just Googled it, it's still out there, it's still a thing. Um, this was many years ago, but it gives you 60 days trade terms, basically they market it as trade terms for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, a business credit card that allows you to, I think, do an interest-free Thing for 60 days on repeated, you know, over and over purchases. No, I had not heard of that. That's interesting. But uh, what I actually use is the Capital One Venture card, which, you know, any credit card you get 30 days to pay it back interest free. So that's mm -hmm. kind of automatic terms there. But yeah. then I also get 2% uh, cash back on right. that. And between my two cards, my personal one and my business one, I think in the, like the last few months, I've got racked up about four thousand dollars worth of of points. So um, that's kind of helpful. Uh, I use that for like vacations and stuff like that. So it's like a built-in vacation fund that uh, I use. Um, so I don't know if you needed the longer terms, and that other one would probably be helpful. But I I usually just go off the thirty rolling thirty days on the credit card and just pay that off every month, so that I don't get any credit uh, or interest on that. And then I also get those points as well, which is nice. So I you know I, I sell the these products that are already they're not my products they're already done. Um, but if I want to start my own store for, and any other entrepreneur that would watch this, would you recommend they they start some in a, in a segment or a niche that they already know the product, they know the customer maybe, something like that? Or would you say that's not really that important and you should just look at, kind of take the approach of 
you know, where is the demand not being filled instead? Well, it's definitely easier if you do a niche that you know. Um, and the reason for that is because if you know the niche, if you're making your own products, you're going to know if it's a good product or not. If you are in the niche and you are involved in it, you're going to know what's good, what's not good. Mm -hmm. um, because one thing you want to do, especially on Amazon now, is differentiate your product. Either make it better than everybody else's by adding something. Um, or whatever the case may be as to why people should buy your products over someone else's products. Um, Amazon is maturing, so the sellers on Amazon are getting bigger and bigger. And while it's still, new people can still get in and make a lot of money on Amazon, it does need to be done a little more professional than what it used to be done so it takes the work of actually building a business rather than just grabbing a product as you said on aliexpress and throwing it up and making uh, fifty thousand dollars or whatever it might be um and to bring aliexpress because i'd never answered that part of it mm -hmm. um, you can still do that but just like with the ebay and the online arbitrage it's getting more difficult to make profits on that because so many people are in doing that. Um, so yeah, the profit margins are getting smaller and smaller and we're really to the point on Amazon where you need to build a business and a reason why people buy your product and improve your product and make it a better product uh, for people to buy it. I was just browsing on their stuff um, on AliExpress and I was looking at it, it was like Man, they got these Robobacks for like half of what we sell Robobacks for. I was like, this is going to make a killing. Nope. I go on Amazon. Those same exact Robobacks are being sold for the exact same price they are on AliExpress um, pretty much. Uh, so I don't know who's how they're making any money on this. But it seems like, yeah, if you find um, a wholesale quote-unquote channel that is really accessible to a lot of people then you're not gonna find any anything that you can mark up yeah I mean I've done it I've uh, I've sold some products direct from Aliexpress in the past and I have one that's still listed uh, it doesn't sell much but I do make a, a profit off of it not because it's uh, different necessarily than what everybody else is selling but because I've branded it different so mm -hmm. everybody else is selling it for one market and I found a use in a complete different market and I tailored my search terms and such for that market um, so I'm selling some products that way directly from Aliexpress um, the only reason I'm doing that though is because then to prove that it's working and then down the line I'm gonna switch it over to a private label where I have my brand um, and I have a manufacturer making them directly for me and probably tweak them and make them better down the line um, so it's not something that I just do to try to make money but if you see an area that's not being served and you use it as a test let's say those robot vacuum cleaners um, you're like, oh, there's not very many people selling these. I want to see if it will work, but maybe if I repurpose it for not cleaning someone's house, but for cleaning the garage and I target that market or whatever, you know, or sweeping up your deck or something and you target the people looking for that, you might be able to get some sales off of that. And then you can say, hey, this is selling. I'm going to take this and go find the actual manufacturer and I'm gonna make these tweaks and make it better for this purpose and sell it as my own product. So that's one way you could use AliExpress to, to kind of test the market a little bit. But I wouldn't really look at buying from AliExpress as a way to make profit as much as a way to maybe test a market that you're not sure about. Seems like the biggest limitation there is, you know, the Amazon consumer, uh, it seems like, you know, we've been trained to like I'm gonna get this thing in three days, and then everything on Ali is like seven to nine. You know, at the at the fastest, is gonna be that really slow. You know, sh literally shipped on a shipping container, probably uh, uh, from China, right? 
Yeah, and with the AliExpress, I'm not buying AliExpress when I sell. I'm saying, oh. hey, that product, I think I could repurpose it. And what's nice about AliExpress is you can order 5, 10, 15, 20 small amounts, get mm -hmm. them, send them into Amazon FBA, and see if they sell. If they sell, order more, um, and just keep ordering kind of like you would from a whole su wholesale supplier until you either want to scrap it or say, hey, this might be a good area to look at doing this seriously. Yeah, I was thinking about them more as a drop shipping thing because mm -hmm. I wanted to start out with just a minimal risk and hopefully just um, learn, you know, step by step, uh, uh, learn as I go kind of with mm -hmm. it without risking a, a large uh, number, a large pool of money. Um, but on that note, do you know of anything like that in the U.S., like what AliExpress, is there a U.S.-based drop shipping index or some kind of um, database at all? Not that I know. I, there is. There is. I've heard of it, but I'm not sure the name off the top of my head. But if you do a Google search for yeah. manufacturers in the United States or drop shippers in the United States, I'm sure you get a lot of results. I don't think there's anything as nice as AliExpress or Alibaba. Mm -hmm. um, but I mentioned earlier that I don't really do drop shipping. I've never done it. <clears throat> and you asked about what things could get your Amazon account suspended. Um, yeah. And that's actually a big one, not not the drop shipping in and of itself, but if you sell something on Amazon and you don't ship it in time or you have mm -hmm. to cancel it or, or it doesn't uh, end up coming to the, the customer or they get the wrong product, too much of that could cause Amazon to suspend your account and your account can very quickly go into... Uh, a negative status uh, if you do a few of those transactions and when you're drop shipping you don't control any of that mm -hmm. you have to sell the product and then hope that the product is still for sale through the drop shipper at the same price and then you make that order through the drop shipper and you have to hope that they ship it out in time that they send you a tracking number that you can enter into Amazon because Amazon yeah. wants to know that information um, yeah. You have to hope they're sending them the right product, and then if there's a return, then you got to go through that dance to get it returned back to the drop shipper. And and for me, even though drop shipping sounds so easy, it also sounds to me just like more hassle than I would want to go through, and more <laughs> risk than that I, than I would want to uh, take with my business on Amazon. With that in mind, what's the largest uh, shipment that you've sent? over to FBA, Fulfilled by Amazon um, Warehouses. Shipment in terms of quantity, uh, on like, average right now, I'm probably sending anywhere between eight to 15 to 20 boxes when I do a shipment. Mm -hmm. um, dollar wise, that's probably, the biggest dollar wise might have been about four or $5,000. Um, but remember, I'm trying to I'm trying to get better at managing my inventory. I need to improve that area, and so that I'm not getting those uh, warehouse fees. So I, it's not like I'm ordering. I mean, the biggest order I've ever made was a ten thousand dollar order uh, from one of the new suppliers that I got because one of their terms was that I could order as long as I ordered more than ten thousand dollars. I could buy it in November and I had to pay for it until May and I got all these big breaks um, in terms of discounts for buying that volume. Um, and I sent that up, sent that into Amazon in, a, in maybe a couple different shipments. So probably four or $5,000 is the biggest shipment going into Amazon. Uh, that, would, that would buy a lot of the, the product I sell. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But well, I was cool. with that. What I was doing is I was testing lots of different products, and I made a lot of different packages out of that stuff, and sent them into Amazon. I bought basically ten thousand dollars worth of stuff, but only like a couple of each thing, or maybe yeah. five or six of each thing. And then I made the packages, sent them into Amazon, and as they sold, and I seen they were profitable, then now I'm reordering larger quantities of the ones that have been successful. Psychologically, at what point did you get comfortable with 
you know, with playing with that that high amount of money, um, with risking, uh, you know, chunks of money like that. I mean, you, I'm, I'm guessing you didn't start with those sizes of orders and and those sizes of shipments. Uh, I don't know how many months in you are uh, with your business now or years. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you get comfortable? Well, I started the business officially January 1st, 2015. That's when I registered the LLC. And so I was just kind of playing with Amazon a little bit and decided that, hey, maybe I want to make a business out of this. Um, plus, by registering as a business, you get whole lots of uh, tax discounts and write-offs and things that otherwise you can't, uh, like writing off your home office and lots of other things. But it kind of slowly went from there. I was selling on eBay before that, and then I found out about this Amazon thing through Scott Volker over at The Amazing Seller, and sent all of the product that I was selling on eBay individually into Amazon, and Amazon lost the whole shipment. It, it wasn't a lot, it was like 30 of these bed sets that I was selling at the time. Oh no. And. I'm like, oh man, now I'm just lost all this. But then Amazon gave me a credit for the retail value of everything that they lost. And I'm like, wow, that's a easy way to sell all my product really fast right away. <laughs> that was the first shipment that I ever sent into Amazon. Wow. And I'm like, so this is kind of interesting. So I started going from there. I ordered more of those bed sets. Um, that worked out okay. But then I found out that I was doing something that... Uh, people really hate and that I didn't know at a time coming from eBay because eBay it doesn't matter um, but on Amazon um, with the private labeling so people order from Alibaba and then brand it and sell it under their brand well, mm -hmm. I didn't know any of that at the time so I was just sending my product which was the exact same product unbranded and selling under this other person's listing um, so I guess I was considered a hijacker at the time even though I didn't know what that was uh, coming from the eBay world because it didn't matter over there you just sold the products you know yeah. um, so I stopped selling that and started dabbling with uh, trying to do my own private labels which I've got a couple well one product that's doing good um, that I think I'll be able to make much better and then I've had a couple products that I am just clearancing out because they're not working the way I wanted them to and then I've got a couple other things uh, off to my left here that I'm gonna be working on and possibly starting to do private label there as well when you say private label just to make sure I understand what you're saying because maybe it varies from industry to industry. I, I always thought of private label as meaning you, you purchase a product that's not your own uh, from, let's say, the manufacturer, mm -hmm. but they allow you to, like, they uh, give you a license to actually like rebrand it as your own brand. Yes, that that is private label, uh, but private label can also be considered your own product. So I would consider what you're selling as your private label products. Okay. Um, and basically I say that is because um, I don't know if you manufacture your products or if you have a company that makes the packaging and puts everything in it and mixes the formulas for you. We do We do pretty much everything. Um, okay. I, Except for you know, we purchase packaging for it, and we, okay. but we, uh, you know, we we print our own labeling and everything on. Uh, yeah, okay. Everything. So yes. you're basically you're a manufacturer and the brand or the private labeler. Right. Um, where Apple, Apple iPhones, Apple doesn't make their own iPhones. They go to a manufacturer who manufactures the iPhones to their specifications and then they put their iPhone logo on it and that's an Apple product. So we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't uh, say anything bad about that or not mm -hmm. necessarily bad, you're not saying anything bad, but you know, Apple is a private labeler on a big scale um, because they go to a manufacturer who makes the products to their specs. Now what you might be looking at is yeah, these manufacturers, they sell this same product to a hundred different people and puts their label on it. Um, 
that could also be called maybe white labeling where you're mm -hmm. taking someone else's product and doing it and that's a viable market um, but what I try to do is I make tweaks to the product to make them better and make them my own and make mm -hmm. them much more difficult for someone else to just get that same product and resell it. So um, you would so, steer clear in this case of, or it's just not your thing to to look for products that are, you know, sold under that brand. For example, like in the in the home brewing world, you know, one of the highest end brewing kettles that you can buy is a Blickman mm -hmm. Engineering Brewing Kettle, and their brand name is very strong. Like they're very well known across the. Uh, in the home brewing world, and even now is in, in pro brewing, yep. they're, they're in a place. So um, you wouldn't sell a product like that with a really strong brand name. Okay. So are you saying, though, as like a wholesale purchaser or private labeling it? Um, you know, buying it whole, wholesale and then selling it on Amazon, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, if it's something that is profitable, for sure. There's okay. no reason not to do that. Um, you know, with wholesaling, exactly. though, the same thing with private labeling a product straight from Alibaba and not making any changes is that you're going to get competition most likely. So you're going to be competing on price in the long run, uh -huh. uh, where if you're making your own products um, and making them different and unique and making them your own, uh, you're... you're having the market more to yourself uh, because your product is unique and it's the only one like that and if there's if it's a benefit your uniqueness is a benefit to the people looking for those products you're going to be able to build a market and build a brand around those products because yours are better or more unique or do something different or have targeted a different market than everybody else yeah it, it sounded like you had a strategy that was trying to to um, distinguish you from some of the other stuff here and um, we probably don't have enough time to, to dig into all that on this at this time but I'd love to talk with you more uh, at some point in the future on um, how you kind of navigate all that yeah for sure we'll have to do a round two and go a little more advanced we've gotten really advanced already <laughs> but but yeah, it's basically, you know, like I said, it's all about building a real business. You know, the, the days of the Amazon gold rush where anyone could just grab any product from AliExpress and throw it up there and become rich, um, those days are gone. And a lot of those people who only thought of it that way are either falling by the wayside or having to refocus on building an actual business. So. Now, though, I think is the perfect time for someone who actually wants to build a legitimate business to get in because mm -hmm. Amazon is still growing. There's a lot of room for growth there yet, and it is still relatively new. Um, and someone who comes in and takes it seriously and builds a business around it can make a lot of money uh, right now on Amazon still. That's really uh, motivating to, to, kind of have to know that. Um, well, the so, yeah. the biggest thing with with all of this, we went through a lot of things, and your my head might be going crazy. Is is just to start where you're already at, or mm -hmm. where you're at now, and and learn more in depth of what you actually need to know. Uh, like for you, you need to the first thing is go make an account and yes. familiarize yourself with Seller Central, learn how that works. And then maybe send five of one of your products in and see if you can start selling on there. Get your first sales uh, through FBA um, or through FBM if you choose to go that route. If you feel more comfortable starting out that way, uh, you could definitely do that because you could probably undercut the people that are already in there and just get your first sale. Um, see how it goes familiarizing yourself with Amazon so and don't worry about all the launching or anything yet um, mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. you get your product in there and you see it there your listing is good you can maybe start tweaking your listing and stuff and then get ready for 
the launch. You can have more products a lot faster than myself where I got to wait maybe 45 days to get it from China. So, <laughs> all right. Yeah, it it's, uh, sounds like a really good, uh, small, actionable goal. And um, I'll, I'll let you know how it goes because I, I think within the next, I think for sure by the end of March, we're going to have some product on Amazon to all right. start. Cool. Yeah. Let me know how it goes. Keep me posted and maybe we can do a follow up video in a few months or something to see where you're at and how things are going. I'm sure I'm going to have a ton more questions then. Uh, <laughs> thanks for taking all of this time. I don't know how much of this is uh, going to be usable, but I'm sure you're going to do a good job editing it. Yeah. No, it's perfect. I think people will enjoy it. We got uh, just taking over to an hour and 40 minutes. So <laughs> <laughs> a lot of good all information right. though. All right. And by the way, if you, I don't know how much you use the Facebook uh, ecosystem with, with, with advertising and marketing. If you ever have any questions on that, I've been doing that for a little while, about a year and a half now, and it's like it's really a new frontier. So there's a lot of changes and a lot mm -hmm. of things to keep up with. So let me know if, um, uh, if you have any pixel or uh, custom audience or any of these kinds of questions there. All right. Sounds good. I will do. Appreciate it.